Okay. Let me bring this down. No, not the whole thing. Can everyone hear me? Because I don't have the loudest voice. Okay. Thank you, Alan, for that really, really nice um, introduction. And thanks to all of you. This has been an amazing day. And being here is an honor, and it's, it, I'm particularly tickled because it is, as you've heard, my home turf. And finally, I get to drag my mom out, and she can hear me speak. So there she is. That's <laughs> So, we will leap into the topic of water is a verb. Boy, did I pick a subject to talk about water and the force of water just weeks after, not even, well, just so close to these mega hurricanes. I know that there are people here from areas that have been affected. And it is humbling to acknowledge the severity of what they've experienced while I've been safely here in the Northeast. You cannot beat the Capital District. Everybody should know that. Well, except in the middle of the winter. So that's another story. Um, so if we're going to get grammatical about it, these storms were the equivalent of exclamation points in bold ink. In a bit, I will toss out a few thoughts about hurricanes and how there is a link to how we manage land. But I want to stress that I have no answers, but I do have lots of questions. That's the chief benefit of being a journalist. Your job is to ask questions, and so you're relieved of always to have an answer. So if there's one thing I'd like to share with you, it's the importance of curiosity about how water works and how water intersects with everything else. So of course, if you're here, you likely know that and have been inspired by the question of how we can better manage land and better serve people, animals, and all the living things that make our landscapes thrive, including, as we've heard earlier today, those all-important insects that we need to, we need to love them more. Keep it up and keep sharing. We are learning all the time, and everything we learn takes us somewhere and can take us far. Water is a verb. In my book, Water in Plain Sight, I chose to focus on water processes, telling stories of people who have learned to ally with the water cycle in order to reach their goals. For I believe that understanding how water works, how it moves across the landscape and through the atmosphere, can not only help us to better manage our operations, but also address some pretty large global problems. I was inspired to pursue this in part because when water gets talked about, it's usually as a noun, as something that's bounded in place, something that you have or I have, and maybe we fight over it. So cue the, okay, we got it, we're fighting over it. So that's the message that we get that this is what water and water management is about. And yet, water is always in motion. It expands in volume or retrenches. It retains or releases energy. It changes state, moving from gas to liquid to solid and back again in an ongoing dialogue with land, plants, and sun. And there we have opportunity. I will give you an example of the kind of thing that made me nuts and frankly drove me to write this book. A few years back during the California drought, all the news reporting focused on what was or wasn't coming down from the sky. Land degradation wasn't mentioned at all. Nothing about the sealing over of soil or the depletion of carbon in the soil. There was an article around that time that made the rounds which had the provocative headline of to end the drought, California needs 11 trillion Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of rain. So, since I was zeroing in on what happens when rain hits the ground, whether it evaporates or streams away, or soaks into the earth to nourish plant and soil microbial life, I found this amusing. You see, if all that rain falls on degraded, depleted soil, or dirt, 
you'll be back in drought soon enough, and you would have wasted some perfectly good swimming pool water, like many trillions worth. <laughs> um, but if you have a healthy, well-managed soil, for example, like all the ranches that you run, with nice, nice, crumbly, aggregated earth, rich in organic matter, maybe you'd only need maybe a few million kiddie pools worth of rain, and you would be fine. So let's break this down a bit and look at various water processes. And then afterwards, we'll tackle some of the bigger, looming questions about weather events that we're experiencing. We'll start with the basic thing that our California headline writers were missing, infiltration. Alan Savory draws attention to this when he says that rather than looking at the overall rainfall of a place, what's more important is how much effective rainfall you have, how much soaks into the ground. Here at the Dimbangombe Ranch in Zimbabwe, holistic plan grazing has enhanced water infiltration so that this river extends a kilometer farther than it has in living memory. And just as important, during the rainy season, it does not flood the way that it does in nearby parkland. I've been talking to people in the permaculture community who have worked with er in areas restoring degraded lands in places like Yemen, Somalia, and Saudi Arabia. And here's their definition of a desert. It is a place where it floods whenever it rains. Because there's no capacity for the water to infiltrate. But we know that this state isn't inevitable or necessarily permanent. Once the land has the capacity to do so, to retain that water, it ceases to be a desert. Infiltration is the water function most clearly connected with grazing practices. Here are a couple of examples of how holistic grazing practices improve infiltration and how transformative this can be. Oh, I just want to pause and say that most of these photos are um, have been taken by my husband, Tony Epoch, who's also here. Okay. Three years ago, Tony and I went to Zimbabwe, and we went to the uh, Africa Center for Holistic Management. And we also had the chance to go to villages and meet people where the Africa Center is working with them to help them with their, with their lands. Animal impact on their crop fields meant more soil organic matter, and that meant better water infiltration. For so the people in Sienyanga in Zimbabwe, way off a dirt road near the Hwangi National Park, that meant being able to grow food for seven months of the year, rather than only two months of the year around the time of the rainy season. So that's tripling the time that they can grow crops. This meant the difference between food self-sufficiency and dependence on international food aid. And talking to these people, they were so happy, they were so proud, and it becomes so clear that being on international food aid is no fun. It's personally demoralizing. Next, we can look at biodiversity. I just love these, <laughs> love these bowls. I think they're so beautiful. So Tony and I went to the Chihuahuan Desert Grasslands um, over in Mexico, where ranchers are working with bird conservation organizations to create a biological corridor for endangered migratory grassland birds. The ranchers who practice holistic land grazing are keeping more water on the land. Their neighbors, by the way, say, well, of course your cattle are doing better you get more rain than we do. Does that sound familiar to any of you? It sounds like, it sounds like it does. And so they are growing a diversity of grasses to feed, shelter, and protect birds that have trouble surviving on desertified land, which, alas, much of the region has become, in large part due to poor grazing practices, also due to very intensive cropping practices. In the Chihuahua area, this is something I had no idea about. There are about there are one 
100,000 Mennonite farmers who use a very industrial, heavily chemical approach to growing crops. One of the problems is that they, that these are people who come from Europe, from Germany, Switzerland, that area, and then they often come to Mexico via Canada. So their intent, their idea of what crops are, are appropriate for those regions. And then they come to Mexico, which has a long, dry season and all that. So to get all that going, they're using all these chemicals, and they're creating biological deserts. And you go by those areas, and you don't see any biodiversity. So these, these ranchers are enhancing the biodiversity through better water infiltration. And in turn, enhanced biodiversity means enhanced land function. So yeah, that was an interesting thing in, in writing the book Water in Plain Sight, is that in exploring the connection between water and biodiversity, I understood and expected to see that that better that enhancing the water cycle means that you can support a greater range of biodiversity and, and range and number of, um, of creatures that you're supporting. But what I learned also is that greater biodiversity also supports the water cycle, enhances the water cycle, because by having, um, whether it's worms or, or deep-rooted plants or dung beetles, prairie dogs, all of these creatures are creating opportunities for the water to meander. It slows the water down. So what you want with the water cycle is you don't want a fast water cycle. You don't want water just moving and, you know, rain falling and tearing down and, you know, tearing across the landscape, pulling up the topsoil and creating those, well, after many, many years, those um, examples of those huge craters that you get with erosion, but rather you want to keep the water on the land, and that's what biodiversity helps you do. I don't know if many of you know, now I'm shifting to another, oh, that, that is in Chihuahua, and that shows how it starts. That, so this is, um, you know, kind of caked earth, it's very dry, but the cattle had been just brought on there recently, or at, at some point, and they're pressing their hooves in and pressing seeds down, creating the opportunity for water to linger and for the grasses to begin to come up. I don't know if many of you know Kelly Mulville, who has an innovative project holistically, with holistically managed sheep in vineyards in California. This is where he's been working in, in Northern California. Thanks to more organic matter, increasing at 1% a year, and therefore better water infiltration, at this, in their project, they were able to reduce irrigation by 90% and also see a rise in yield. Originally, Kelly was focused on the land. That was his, his main priority and not the wine. And so when it came to, you know, seeing the results, he was a little nervous because he really wasn't sure what all the sheep moving around there was, what effect it would have on the taste. He had the vintner do a blind taste test, and guess what? The grapes grown with sheep produced a tastier wine. Now on to transpiration. I, I interviewed Antonio Nobre, author of a report called The Future Climate of Amazonia, and he's based in Brazil. The Amazon rainforest has about, and this is what he shared with me, the Amazon rainforest has about 4 billion trees. Together, these trees act like geysers and spout a river of vapor into the air, an aerial river which flows five, five, through which flows five times as much water as the mighty Amazon River itself. This flowing river is a result of transpiration, the upward movement of water through plants. You can think of it as the plant sweating. The stomata on the leaves or with grass, the blades open to, on, on, on the blades, open to retain or release moisture to cool the plant itself and the soil in the nearby vicinity. What's important is that this is a cooling mechanism. 
transforming solar heat, solar radiation, into latent heat suspended in water vapor, as opposed to sensible heat or heat you can feel, like what you get on a hot sidewalk when the sun is beaming down and that there's nothing there to mediate that heat. According to Czech botanist Jan Pekorny, the transpiration activity of one tree, one good-sized tree on a sunny day, represents three times the cooling capacity of an air conditioning system in a, in a luxury hotel. So we can think of the air conditioning system that we have here at the Desmond and just think about how much more power, cooling power, we get from a tree. The cooling factor is important, but transpiration also drives the movement of water. There's an excellent paper by biologist Douglas Shield called How Plants Water Our Planet. It begins, most life on land depends on water from rain, but much of the rain on land may also depend on life. He looks into recent research showing that vegetation has an influence on rain and rainfall patterns. Most significant are trees, as we've seen, they are champions of transpiration, but also grasses. Transpiration from plants accounts for 80 to 90 percent of the atmospheric moisture over land, and this is important for rainfall. According to the nonprofit We Forest, which is one of my, my newest nonprofit crushes, about 40 percent of rainfall over land is recycled from evaporative transpiration from landscape surfaces. Ecologists are starting to use the term precipitation shed to describe the source area of land and water that generates a region's rain. Having plant cover with those plants transpiring keeps water in the local system. I talked to one rancher, actually someone you may know, Michael Thompson in Kansas. He, he was featured in one of Peter Bick's films. I think it was after the drought during the drought, something about the drought. That's, that's Michael. He says that, when the, that he's observed that when there is a lot of fallow in the area, he sees that the rain, the move, rain that moves in across the, the prairie region seems to split and go around them. This echoes um, what a lot of people were telling me. I was just recently in Mexico and I was talking about this and people were, were talking about the same phenomenon. Finally, condensation. This is the process of water vapor turning back to liquid. It is closely connected with transpiration. You can think of it as its meteorological mirror. One reason is that with plant co- oh, one reason that with plant cover, Michael Thompson sees more rain could be that those plants are releasing minute particles, aerosols that provide a surface for water to condense around. We call these precipitation nuclei. Now, one interesting thing that a, an Australian scientist named Walter Yenna has pointed out is that precipitation nuclei j- tend to come from biological sources. So from trees, from, from bacteria that may be in plants or um, in, in the system. However, when you have degraded, desertified soil, it, you know, when you have dirt, when you have, you know, dry, dusty dirt, when those particles go into the atmosphere, they're really minute. They're, they're too small to be effective precipitation nuclei. So someone, someone in this room maybe needs to write a book about dust. Just putting it out there. <laughs> um, so um, there's a lot of new research about how the microbiology of rain and how bacteria and various volatile organic compounds, Antonio Nobre in Brazil calls it fairy dust, from plants play a role in creating, creating rainfall. Here is a landscape that's defined by condensation. This is a cloud forest in central Mexico, and I had the chance to, to visit this area in the Sierra Gorda in the mountains in March, and it was 
really so beautiful. I can't even tell you. And I have to say that the, that the first thing that struck me about being in a cloud forest is that it sounded nice. You could hear the, you know, the moisture falling. It, it, there was just this, this beautiful little sound of, of something that, this liquid sound that was really quite beautiful. There are many trees in various ecosystems that specialize in fog that literally comb moisture from the air to obtain water. So some of you may know these people, that the Sierra Gorda people are part of the savory, I don't know, they're not quite a hub, they're, they, but they're associated. And one, what, what has motivated this group, first of all, they have managed to get the entire state of Pedatero to declare one-third of the state a biodiversity reserve. And that's pretty fabulous. What, what, what they've been able to do is create employment opportunities for local people who otherwise, in order to take part in the overall global economy or, you know, to support themselves, basically, would need to essentially undermine their own resource by cutting down the forest. So what was happening is that people were bringing their cattle into the, into the forest and cutting down trees, and, and that just was not a good thing. But now they, they're creating opportunities through local eateries. It's called, it's called the Flavor Trail and ecotourism and supporting the – also they have an artisan trail and one – really valuable thing about these efforts is that it also helps people maintain their traditions. Pedro, uh, Roberto, Pe Roberto Pedraza Ruiz, the photographer, who, who is both a naturalist and a photographer, has, in just the last couple of years, identified three new species of magnolia in these cloud forests. And I saw them. I saw a bunch of baby magnolia trees. And one of them was named after Roberto. Condensation is also a source of water. In my book on water, I write about a couple in far west Texas who designed their rain barn to collect condensation. They didn't realize how much water they were capturing until one winter morning, four months after the last rainfall, when the water tank overflowed. This is Marcus, Marcus um, Otmers in, with his, with the water tank in, to, near, outside of Trilingua, Texas, um, which, you know, you, you see a bumper sticker down there, Trilingua, um, hotter in hell and cooler than shit. So that's, that's the spirit. Um, there's an Australian farmer, rancher, that I um, interviewed for my book. His name is Chris Hengler, and he manages an area of land that is larger than the entire five boroughs of New York City. And he practices holistic management. He says that he pays as much attention to do as to other sources of water as it supports a healthy ecosystem and microclimate. He says, there are all those additional microorganisms that can keep active throughout extended periods well after the rainy season, as long as they get a watering each night. In a living system, moisture generates more moisture, he says, of which dew is one manifestation. Now to the hurricane connection. This is, this is an article that the same um, ecologist that I mentioned, Douglas Shiel, posted. So this is kind of complicated, so I'm just going to do a kind of top-line observations. Basically, through talking about these water processes, infiltration, transpiration, and condensation, we get a sense of moisture moving around, of landscapes with plant cover, which are cycling moisture and other landscapes which are bare and desert-like. Basically, what we're dealing with, because of poor management, and sometimes over, you know, deep, long periods of history, we're dealing with a distorted energy cycle. 
There's an interesting quote by someone in a book, um, one of the founders of meteor- meteor- okay, let me try this again. meteorology in a book called Air, saying that heat energy becomes kinetic energy. With parched landscapes, such as we have had recently in the far west, all that heat energy moves unimpeded until it hits all that moisture that has been blocked because there hasn't been enough moisture for it to be cycling. Restoring the small water cycle, keeping water in place, which we see that we can do through better management, including through better grazing practices that have all the benefits that we've been talking about today, that is what's needed. Which comes back, so it comes back to rebuilding the soil sponge, rebuilding soil carbon, rebuilding it, it all connects to building biodiversity for all the plants that keep the system going, so it, it all connects. I'm just back from the Regeneration International Assembly in Mexico, which was made all the more intense because of the earthquake particularly as some people, several people that were part of the group, the sponsoring group, Via Organica, live in Mexico City and knew people who were affected. Now, one thing that was discussed there, and let's see if I can articulate it, is that, okay, so we have dry parched landscapes, which means increased risk of wildfires. We have that connected to hurricanes, and these have been some very powerful hurricanes, bringing vast quantities of water. And then we have earthquakes. And what people there were saying is that there is a connection there because with the huge quantities of water that are coming to the land, that's a lot of weight. That puts a lot of pressure on the land. And this intense pressure on the land affects areas at the tectonic plates. You know, I mean, everything is connected, as we talked about before, everything is connected. And so those areas that are particularly affected by, by earthquakes, that are on, on and near the fault lines, become extremely vulnerable. And they described to me several instances where Earthquakes did follow hurricanes. This was completely new to me, and I don't know where it's been documented. I only got that late last night, so forgive me if I haven't done research on that yet. Let me share with you something, because, because this trip is so fresh with me, a goal that several of us came up with. Okay, so, you know, we all have our our business goals and our community goals and our goals to restore our ecosystems and and to um, share the importance of drawing down carbon for all sorts of reasons. So this is a goal that several of us came up with. Okay. By three years from now, to have more than 50% of land, of land rangelands and agricultural lands, managed in a regenerative way. And I'm putting this out to you because all of you are so central to the solution. So, thank you.